Good evening. Welcome, and thanks for coming to the Boston Public Library's Local History Lecture Series. As part of our program, we want to read the following statement to bring attention to the land which we use for our building and events. We acknowledge that the Boston Public Library's Central Library stands on land that was once a water-based ecosystem, providing sustenance for the indigenous Massachusetts people and is a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We are committed to land acknowledgements for all locations at which we operate. We reaffirm this commitment to set the context for our planning, deliberations, and public engagement, which will take place from the spirit of welcome and respect found in our motto, free to all. Tonight, we are very pleased to have Anthony Samarco here to give a talk entitled, Cranberry's New England's Bounty. Anthony M. Samarco is a noted historian and author of over 70 books on the history and development of Boston, and he lectures widely on the history of his native city. His books, Lost Boston, The History of Howard Johnson's, Jordan Marsh, The Baker Chocolate Company, and Christmas Traditions in Boston have been bestsellers. This program is being recorded. Questions will be taken at the end of the lecture. Please wait for the microphone microphone to speak your question. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming out on such a beautiful evening. 60 degrees in late November. It's really quite nice. But this is a lecture on cranberries, and this was something by the 19th century became part of New England's economy. I call it New England's bounty because we have a summer house on Cape Cod, and near us is a cranberry bog. I watch it from the four seasons. By the spring, it actually begins to turn red, and by summer, it's beautiful. And they actually harvest the cranberries in a water-based harvest, as you see here. But the concept is, in some ways, I use cranberries throughout the year. But many people feel, in some ways, that cranberries are something that are really only used in the fall months. But I think of it as something that's really the most tart and sweet at the same time, fruit that's available. Well, this is a lecture that I had put together a couple of years ago to actually highlight the cranberry industry in New England. In a lot of ways, I began to research in such ways not only old botanical prints, as you see here, of the 18th century, but how it affected not only the Native Americans of Massachusetts, as they call what is today the state of Massachusetts, but also in some ways how they used it. And cranberries are a group of evergreen dwarf shrubs and trailing vines in the subgenus Oxycoccus. The cranberry was called Sassamanesh by the Algonquin and, and Imbibi by the Wampanoag, which translates literally as bitter or sour berries. Native Americans ate cranberries as fresh fruit, dried the fruit and formed them into cakes to store and made tea out of the leaves. Native Americans also used the cranberry to make dye for their rugs and blankets and found the cranberry plant to be a valuable source for medicinal purposes, using it both to treat wounds as a poultice and to help prevent certain illnesses. So it was well known even in the 16th and 17th century. But when Massachusetts Bay Colony was settled by the Puritans, it was something that had grown here for time immemorial. And on the left-hand side is basically an early 20th century watercolor of cranberries. And on the right is the Reverend John Eliot, the apostle to the Indians from Roxbury. Well, the name cranberry derives from the German cranbear. The English translation would be really craneberry. And the first named as cranberry in English by the Reverend John Eliot of Roxbury in 1647. Eliot was known as the Apostle to the Indians and was to found Roxbury Latin School in 1645. In 1660, he completed the enormous task of translating the Eliot Indian Bible into the Massachusetts Indian language. So we realized that it was also something the Puritans would actually cultivate. 
but by the early part of the 19th century, cranberries were beginning to be actually grown in what were cranberry bogs. This is a watercolor called Cranberry Girl, and she is seen picking cranberries. In the early 1800s, a sea captain and Revolutionary War veteran named Captain Henry Hall transplanted cranberry vines to his property in North Dennis, Massachusetts. And there on Cape Cod, Hall found the cranberries did best when they received sandy soil from the nearby dunes, and soon he was producing enough cranberries to ship them to Boston and New York. And during that period of time, because cranberries had a shelf life and also could be dried, we realized that they would actually be taken onto packet ships. And seen here in the early 19th century on Cape Cod, Captain Hall found that cranberries were so abundant that he barreled them and did a booming trade up and down the seacoast. American whalers and mariners always carried cranberries on their voyages to prevent scurvy, as they had the necessary vitamin C. Not every ship could actually have uh, lemons or limes, which of course are a great source of uh, vitamin C for scurvy prevention, but seen here as a treaty of scurvy, scurvy in three parts. So this was something that wasn't just enjoyed locally, but now was being shipped in and around the New England states. But cranberries are an indigenous material to the northern United States and were enjoyed by Native Americans in New England long before European colonists arrived. The Narragansett and Wampanoag called the berries sassaminash and used cranberries to make pemmican, sun-dried meat or fish cakes, namseg, grits, or combine the berries with maple sugar to create a sweet sauce. In addition to being an important food source, cranberries were also used to dye fabric and also had medicinal properties good for blood poisoning and poultices. And on the left-hand side, one can see a print of about 1878 showing the men in the top portion creating the cranberry bogs. They'd have to remove the bogs and, of course, place it in such a way that sand would be used to plant the cranberries. Well, by the 1840s, cranberries was a thriving industry, and seen here in a print of about 1865, picking and sorting cranberries on Cape Cod, you realize that this was something that was a labor-intensive um, operation. The women in the foreground would pick by hand, and then women would sort and pick through the individual cranberries to get rid of twigs, leaves, and even small rocks. During this period of time, people began to see in some ways that it was something that was not an old-fashioned industry, but it was something that took place throughout New England. And here, Eastman Johnson would do a painting, Cranberry Pickers, on the island of Nantucket. This was painted in 1880. And as you realize, because they actually ripened, usually in September, all of the town would turn out to actually assist in the growing as well as in the picking of the cranberries. And here, a group of men, as you see here, it says cranberry picking on Cape Cod, you see white lines that have been laid throughout this cranberry bog. By this period, people were being paid by the number of cranberries they picked. And they could only pick within those lines themselves. But you can realize in some ways that each individual picker would dump them into the barrels. The barrels would then be taken to a screening house and actually begin to be processed. In this period of the 1860s to 1900, cranberry picking took place throughout Cape Cod, Edgartown, and Nantucket, but we realized in some ways that it would eventually spread even to the Midwest. And in this photograph, we see adults, young adults, and even children. It was an important feature to realize that many times people would actually be given off school so they could actually pick cranberries. That was how lucrative a business it was. But it was also something that many people did courting. And in this detail of a much larger 1878 print, we see two men carrying a barrel of cranberries, and of course, they courted one another. It actually is said at the bottom. But in that instance, you realize that these major purveyors of cranberries would actually come down to us well into the 20th century. This is A.D. Makepeace, who owned Makepeace Company, and it was based in Wareham, and is the world's largest cranberry grower. 
the largest private property owner in eastern Massachusetts, and a recognized leader in environmentally responsible real estate development and stewardship. Seen here as Abel Dennison Makepeace, he was a farmer, businessman, and inventor whose lasting legacy is a cranberry empire, and it continues to this day in the fifth generation. He was somebody who learned from Captain Hall exactly how to grow them, but also to market them. And during that period of the 1890s to 1900, it wasn't just a New England type of an industry. Many Portuguese, as well as Cape Verdeans, who were coming to New England, would actually be hired to pick the cranberries. And as we see here in a group of women and young children, they're all from Cape Verde. The cranberry, along with the blueberry and Concord grape, is one of the only three native fruits grown commercially in North America. So this was a very important industry. And here we see in Harwich Port, Massachusetts, again, young children. I mean, if you look on the right-hand side, they're probably no more than seven or eight years of age, each one with a lined-out area in which to pick. So this was something in some ways that became a community effort. And of course, Makepeace was one of the largest owners of cranberry bogs on Cape Cod. The American Cranberry Growers Association was formed in 1871, and the Cape Cod Cranberry Growers Association was established in 1888. The growing and harvesting of cranberries was so essential to the economy of southern Massachusetts that up until 1927, children could be excused from school to work the bogs during the harvest time. Traditionally, cranberries grew in wetlands, and today, even the man-made cranberry beds are referred to as cranberry bogs. Contrary to popular belief, these bogs are actually dry for the majority of the growing season, and they're only flooded at harvest time. And when the bogs are flooded, the cranberries are dislodged and float to the top of the water, making it easy to collect them. And the vast majority of cranberries are harvested in this way, and then are processed to make dried fruit, sauce, and the official beverage of Massachusetts, cranberry juice. But the photograph is a wonderful rendition of an 1893 photograph. The young girl actually holds a bale on the right-hand side, and that was typical of the earlier part of the 19th century, a pail that she could actually use to fill with cranberries. But on her other hand is a cranberry scoop, something that had actually been patented and allowed people to simply scoop it and hopefully leave twigs and stones and branches and only take the cranberries. This was such an important feature that here in 1906, Chandler's Improved was a manufactured cranberry scoop by George H. Chandler of Marshfield, Massachusetts. And in 1906, he was somebody who realized in this instance with a wooden scoop, he was able not only to make an early attempt at reducing the labor-intensive picking by hand, but it was something in some ways that was marketed throughout the United States. And here on eBay, I did buy this. It was something that I thought would look great above my desk. And not only did I get it, but the burlap was falling to pieces. But it's a great example, as you can see here, of a scoop itself that actually was an important part of revolutionizing how the cranberry industry could actually save on time and energy. But by the period of 1900, this woman does have a scoop. It's much larger. This was not a Chandler scoop. But you began to realize that Cape Cod cranberries was something that were not only marketed as being unique, they were fancy, they were larger, they were more plump than any other cranberries in the country. But they also were packed by New England cranberry sales in Middleborough, Massachusetts, and marketed not only to the Boston market, but New York, New Jersey, and even the Midwest. During the 19th century, many realized that sorting cranberries was something that was an important part. You not only had, as you see here on the left-hand side, boxes of cranberries, but the sorting had to be done by hand. And again, the young child holds a complete bale, pail filled with cranberries. So it was something in this instance people began to see that this was an important part. But also, 
not only did you have Chandler's scoop, you also, as you saw here, Chandler's that actually had handles that you simply pushed, much like a push lawnmower that would actually bring up the cranberries and allow them to be dumped into the barrels. Each of these labor-saving devices were really quite good, but you realized in some ways that it was still a labor-intensive over three weeks. And here, with Ocean Spray Cranberry brand boxes on the left-hand side, you see a cranberry bog in 1930. And again, people working in unison as a one line, scooping the cranberries from the bogs themselves. This is dry scooping. It wasn't flooded that allowed them to float to the top, but it was an important feature as you began to see the cultivation. And by the late 19th century, Plymouth and Barnstable counties in Massachusetts had thousands of acres dedicated to the cultivation of cranberry. The American Cranberry Growers Association was formed in 1871, and we realized that the growing and harvesting of cranberries was so essential to the economy of southern Massachusetts that up until 1927, children, as I mentioned, could be excused from school to work the bogs during harvest time. This young child, she's probably no more than seven years of age, has two gallon pails on either side filled with cranberries. She was paid according to the weight of her pail. And here again, a cranberry bog lined off with pickers at work, and you began to see in that three-week period from mid-September right to the beginning of the mid of October, this was a major part of the community's endeavor. Well, the cranberry was important in many ways to producing the community we live in today. It provided a needed source of income to many families during the economically depressed decades following the Civil War. The cranberry industry also encouraged emigration by people from the Cape Verde Islands who had been involved in New England's whaling industry on the decline in the latter part of the 19th century. And if you look at this photograph, again with the Chandler scoops, these are men from Cape Verde. This was something that we saw being done throughout the Cape. As they scooped them, they'd be placed into these barrels, sorted as they would be continued, and on the right-hand side, the individual boxes would then be brought to the screening house. These photographs from the 1940s showed no difference, so to speak, with what had been done 50 years before. And here, with a horse, this farmer in the cranberry bog could probably bring in at least a 1,000 pounds of cranberries on a daily basis. It was still labor-intensive, but it was also something that made people begin to realize that this was a major source of income. Well, each of these cranberry bogs had screen houses, and they were purposely built wooden structures that had in the interior the area where they would actually process the cranberries. These buildings look very simple. They almost look like a residence, but the interiors would really be quite interesting. This man would actually have a screener on the right-hand side. The two women on the left are doing it by hand. They actually pick not only the individual cranberries, but they also pick out any foreign substances. And the man on the right-hand side is using a machine that would separate the cranberries from anything else. And seen here in the interior of the greenhouse, cranberries are poured into a mechanical sorter that vibrates and tumbles the berries to remove stems and leaves. And notice the wood barrels on the right. These were an important part. Every greenhouse had a cooper who made the barrels because these would then be shipped to whichever source they could actually find to actually take them as a saleable item. And in this way, in a photograph of about 1910, a man places the lid onto the wooden barrel, but you can see how they've sorted everything. So during this period, it was a major feature of not only growing them, processing them, and then shipping them, that they became so well known. Well, here in a photograph from the 1940s, these boxes replaced the barrels, and they were the, still the same weight. But in this instance, this was the Ocean Spray screening house, and it was me mechanically inclined that it would actually have a process. And during this period, people began to realize that the annual crops of cranberries, and this is the period of the first 
three and a half decades of the 20th century, included not just Massachusetts, but New Jersey, Long Island, and New York, and Wisconsin. And the value of crops based on American Cranberry Exchange with an average selling price per barrel. Well, you can see 700,000 barrels could actually be processed on an annual basis between these individual states. And of course, the product was something that was consumed, but the value was 32.92% above average, and that was in the year 1935. So cranberries were a major part of the economy. They not only provided income for the people that picked them and sorted them, but it was also something we began to see people like Makepeace and Ocean Spray making a profit through the industry. But today, when we think of cranberries, one of the first things that comes to mind is cranberry sauce. And cranberry sauce is synonymous with Thanksgiving. And seen here, the first Thanksgiving in 1621 was painted by Jenny Brownscombe in a painting of 1914 and is a popular interpretation of the first Thanksgiving and has become a symbol of the holiday for many Americans. It reached a wide audience and influenced the national understanding when it was printed in Life magazine. And though only four women survived the first year from the pilgrims that had settled from the Mayflower, here we see people seated at a long table, not just the pilgrims, but the Wampanoag Indians, and it's an interpretation of what Thanksgiving might have been like. But we also realized in that period that not only did Winslow Homer, a very well-known artist, depict Thanksgiving Day the dinner, but we see here it appeared in Harper's Weekly in 1858. As father carves the roast turkey and guests clink wine glasses in a toast to Thanksgiving, notice the children's table on the right, an age-old rite of passage where they would be seated until they were old enough to be seated with the adults. And of course here, the wild turkey. This was a print done by John James Audubon and appeared as plate number one in his monumental work, The Birds of America. And since the time of the pilgrims, the wild turkey has proliferated in America and in his book by attempting to paint one page each day and painting with a newly discovered technique, Audubon paid homage to the noble wild bird that became synonymous with Thanksgiving. It was said that Audubon was so fond of wild turkeys that he used a painting of one as the first image in his magnificent Birds of America, and he also used a miniature version as his personal seal. The turkey became the ideal for Thanksgiving, and seen here with Thomas Nast's wonderful lithograph, Uncle Sam's Thanksgiving Dinner, which appeared in Harper's Weekly in 1869, we see Uncle Sam on the upper right-hand side standing at the head of the dining room table, and he's carving a turkey for the representatives of the diverse immigration that was taking place in the decades after the Civil War. Native Americans, African, Chinese, Irish, German, French, Spanish, Arab, and Italian. Thomas Nast idealizes dinner into an all-inclusive American feast with Columbia, the symbol of America on the left, seated between an African man and a Chinese man. And in the corners, come one, come all, and free and equal, refer to the eclectic mixture of guests and represent the new America and his support of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. In 1870, Boston had a population of 250,000 people, of which one half were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. So we began to see people coming to the new world. Here was Thanksgiving, part of the pilgrim culture, and many people began to realize that the turkey was synonymous with Thanksgiving, but we began to see ethnic foods becoming part of the Thanksgiving feast. And one of the most iconic paintings is Freedom from Want. And this is one of Norman Rockwell's most wonderful paintings, part of the Four Freedom series, with an elderly couple standing at the head of the dining room table as a roast turkey is placed on the table to be carved. Norman Rockwell used his own Vermont dining room as the backdrop for this famous painting, and he enlisted family members and neighbors to join at the table as models, including his cook, Mrs. Thaddeus Wheaton, who is depicted as serving the turkey. 
and the painting appeared in the Saturday Evening Post on March 6th of 1943, and since that time has become the most well-known and iconic image of Thanksgiving. But of course, during that period, cranberries were part of it. And here, during the period of the 1920s, Eat More Cranberries, which was the name of the company, but Eat More meant, of course, Eat More. It had the Mayflower brand, and that was the trademark of this Cape Cod Cranberry. And what do we see? We see the Mayflower in the very center. So during this period, they were even hearkening back to the pilgrims of 1621 with the purported first Thanksgiving, and the Mayflower brand was one that was available. But by the 20th century, ocean spray cranberry sauce would actually see here, new packs ready. Jellied ocean spray cranberry sauce is at your grosses too. Make your turkey taste better. It's better for you. So not only do we have a roasted turkey, slices of oranges, but cranberry sauce cut in little stars. It's a lot of work just basically to serve cranberry sauce. But it's a great example of this marketing advertisement of the 1950s and 1960s. But you could also have Jell-O for dessert and how Jell-O became part of Thanksgiving. Well, in all the years that Jell-O has been around this country, it's pretty well entered just about every part of American life. And to bring them together, that no simple task. But we finally found a way. Jell-O gelatin and cranberry salad. So this Thanksgiving, use our coupon and try one of the new recipes for your holiday table. Well, cranberry jelly was not only delicious, but the jello was even better. And here, two well-dressed children sit down to Thanksgiving dinner admiring a huge roast turkey, ready to be carved along with the obligatory glass tray of canned jelly cranberry sauce. Ocean Spray says that the first commercial cranberry sauce was canned in 1912 by Marcus Uran, who owned cranberry bogs in Hanson, Massachusetts. Uran developed cranberry juice cocktail in 1933 and later created a syrup for mixed drinks. And the famous canned cranberry sauce log as we know it today became available nationwide in 1941. And though we do prepare homemade cranberry sauce, I couldn't bear not to have a canned log of jellied cranberry sauce at my table. And you see here, even Valentine's Day, it wasn't just Thanksgiving, would show you three ways to serve cranberry hearts. I would prefer a chocolate heart, but cranberry hearts here could simply be cut out of a slice of cranberry sauce. And in that instance, it looked not only attractive, but it was the appropriate color. And of course here, make piece cranberry sauce. As we see in that instance, they too would can it. And make piece cranberry sauce served thoroughly chilled as refreshing, appetizing, and much relished in spring and summer, as in autumn and winter. It provides wholesome and tonic food value. So in this way, yes, you could serve it as a jellied cranberry sauce. You could serve it with cream cheese in sandwiches. And on the right-hand side, the young boy eats a cranberry pie slice. And of course, Eat More Cranberries would show you in a dozen different ways. By stocking your pantry with jars of 10-minute cranberry sauce and cranberry jelly, your family could enjoy a variety of things of cranberry sauce, cranberry meringue pie, cranberry shortcake, and of course, even such things as cranberry pudding. Each of these came with an individual recipe, and it showed how versatile the cranberry really was. Well, by the 1950s, Beaton's Fresh Cranberries was also in the competition. They provided, as you see here, not only recipes on the back of their individual packages, but they said that it was delicious served with meat and poultry, and you'll enjoy it served with toast at breakfast. This was something that Beaton said was as you like it, and frozen cranberries could also be prepared for extra shelf life. Harvest Queen, the queen of the seas, meaning Cape Cod, would show Cape Cranberries as something that, again, one quarter barrel, which was quite a large amount of cranberries, could now be available for your per per perusal. But during that period, 
we began to realize that Eatmore did dozens of different trademarks. This is the Priscilla brand. And of course, who comes to mind but Priscilla Mullen Alden. And we realized that she was one of the women that did survive that winter of 1620 to 1621. And we realized she's seated by a spinning wheel and she's spinning wool. Very nice, attractive. But they also had delicious Cape Cod cranberries. And you see here that they had places in Plymouth and Wareham. Each of these individual cranberries probably tasted not a little bit different. They were all the same, but they had wonderful advertising. The Blue Parrot brand, which was done by Collie Cranberry, distributing from the Cape to Boston. They also had the Faneuil Hall brand. And in this instance, we see Faneuil Hall, recently such a bone of contention. They also had the Bunker Hill brand cranberries. And of course, the Harvard brand. Now, Harvard was important. It was 1636 that it was founded, but many people actually went to Yale, so they had the Yale brand as well. So each of these applied to different people, and of course, each of these trademarks were really just a poof on what was basically a standard cranberry. But at Christmas, the Santa Claus brand was really quite a fun one. In this instance, Eat More Cranberries was something that marked these throughout the country and in Canada. And they became really synonymous with not only the availability, but the versatility of the cranberry. But it was ocean spray that really took it to new heights. Beginning in some ways in 1930, a group of cranberry growers, including A.D. Makepeace, formed the cranberry cooperative Ocean Spray in Hanson, Massachusetts. Today, when we see ocean spray cranberry, it's a little more expensive. It's said to be better. But you began to realize in this instance, it wasn't just things that were being provided from Hanson, Massachusetts. You can see that it says Wisconsin Searles Jumbos. Because by the 1940s and 50s, it was being grown not only in the Midwest, but the Northwest and Canada. And these were an important feature because John Makepeace, who was the son of, of course, um, the father who had started the business, in his day grew more cranberries than anyone in the world. In 1930, with Marcus Uran and Elizabeth Lee, he founded the Ocean Spray Cranberry Company, then called Cranberry Canners, a growers' cooperative that was dominated the cranberry world ever since. Cranberries were picked during a six-week period, before canning technology, the product had to be consumed immediately, and the rest of the year there was almost no market. Uran's canned cranberry sauce and juice are revolutionary innovations because they produced a product with a shelf life of months, and months instead of just days. Seen as Mar Marcus Uran down below, but we also realize that this is the Cape Cod's Ocean Spray Cranberry Company uh, screening house. And of course, they also provided employment well into the 20th century. And these women would actually have a conveyor belt on the left-hand side of individual cranberries, and they would sort them by hand. This was something that was really quite interesting. They had tried so often to actually have labor-saving devices. But this was something that provided employment for dozens of women in each screening house. And here in a photograph of 1945, we have Ocean Spray Jelly Cranberry Sauce, Ocean Spray Whole Cranberry Sauce, and Ocean Spray Cranberry Juice Cocktail. Cranberries have a, an acquired taste. They can be very tart and bitter. But with sugar, they can be quite delicious. And in this instance, with a canned or bottled product, it had shelf life of at least a year. But Makepeace would also make what he called evaporated cranberries. They were more convenient and economical than fresh fruit. These were what we would call dried cranberries today. And they were said to be pure, healthful, and appetizing. You could even eat them by the handful. But the whole concept was this was the first beginning of making dried cranberries. You also saw that Ocean Spray had a giant cranberry bottle that was in Onset, Massachusetts on Route 6 and 28. 
the massive bottle, which was said to be 32 feet in height, was built in 1931 adjacent to a small roadside stand that sold refreshing Ocean Spray Cranberry Juice Cocktail. The bottle only lasted four years, meaning the one on the left. It was demolished in 1935, but you can see on the right-hand side a bottle of Cranberry Juice Cocktail. In that instance, you might stop here and onset, enjoy something that was not only refreshing, but actually this wonderful kitsch that really did only last four years. And here, by the period of the 1960s, Ocean Spray Cranberry did photographs for a marketing ploy. Here, the woman in the foreground uses a Chandler Cranberry scoop, dumping the cranberries into the boxes, the man on the right-hand side uses a wheelbarrow to bring them to the screenhouse. But these were an important feature to show that this is something that had sustained itself since the early part of the 19th century. And even here, seen harvesting cranberries, the man is still using this Chandler scoop. This is the dry harvesting. And in that instance, these were things that I think were done for advertising. It wasn't done that way on a daily basis. But during that period, many people began to realize that ocean spray was becoming the big boy on the block, and they created Cape Cod's most famous cranberry recipes, and made with ready-to-serve ocean spray cranberry sauce. It could be a variety of things, but on the right-hand side, you could actually, during fresh cranberry time, make something that was called Spam and Cranberries. Well, Spam is something I've never, ever bought, but... You could make this happy tasting treat tonight. It says combine two cups of sugar, two cups of water, and cook five minutes. Add four cups of eat more cranberries, cook an additional eight minutes, and then pour it over sliced spam. And when you baked it, it became the most obviously delicious item you could serve your family. So these were things in some ways that you could really do. But they also began to provide things such as these recipes for a cranberry frap. Number one, place a heaping spoonful of ice cream in a mixing bowl. Number two, fill two-thirds full of cranberry juice cocktail. Number three, beat thoroughly. And we did have one of those beaters when I was a child. And number four, serve. Delicious, refreshing, and again, the sweetness of the ice cream and the tartness of the cranberry juice cocktail. Really quite fun. But the jellied cranberry sauce seen here is something we see in every supermarket. Americans consume 400 million pounds of cranberries every year. 20% of that amount, or 80 million pounds, are consumed during the week of Thanksgiving. So it's an indispensable condiment on your dining room table. Well, in some ways, here for Father's Day, they would actually advertise, let's have a chicken queue. Not a barbecue, but a chicken queue. And the chickens have been marinated not only with cranberry sauce, but they actually are served with cranberry sauce. This, again, was something a little bit different. But it was also the fact that you could actually, during Easter, brighten the plate with ocean spray. One has a roast turkey and a roast ham, but on the right-hand side, you could make an Easter bunny face with the addition of two slices of pimentoed olives and whiskers from scallions. Fun. So we have Valentine's Day, we have Father's Day, and we have Easter. And people began in some ways to realize how wonderful cranberries could be. Well, here in 1980, Pierpont Glass, which is the successor to the Sandwich Glass Factory, produced this teacup plate. These are little plates that actually one would place the tea bag after you had taken out of your cup. And this was for the 50th anniversary of Ocean Spray. Not only was it cranberry in color, but you can see the cranberry, the bird, in the very center, along with a cranberry piece, not only with the, the fruit, but also the leaves of the plant as well. An important feature and a great collectible. But cultivated cranberry industry spread to New Jersey by the 1830s. 
to Wisconsin by the 1850s and the Pacific Northwest by the 1880s. And we see on the left-hand side the Cranberries National Cranberry Magazine. And you see that they were actually growing in Cape Cod, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Oregon, Washington, and Canada. Today, in addition to Massachusetts, the major growing areas for cranberries are around the world. Additional regions with cranberry production include Delaware, Maine, Michigan, New York, Rhode Island, as well as the Canadian provinces of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Ontario, and Prince Edward Island. And here on the lower right-hand side, Mastodon cranberries. These must have been a very large cranberry from Ganges, Ohio. I love that advertisement. But Long Beach it was something that you'd see Washington's finest cranberry since 1883. And this is Washington State. And you began to realize that you see these men beginning to harvest with the wet harvest the Long Beach cranberries for juicing, sauces, and baking. And of course here, every product has a Miss whatever. Well, this was Miss Cranberry Sauce. Now everybody wears a bikini with waders up to her thighs, but she's in a cranberry bog. And I love the photograph because if you look at the two men, they're actually looking at the box of cranberries. They're not looking at her. But you see on the left-hand side, name the Eat More Cranberry Girl. Well. Look at that outfit. She's really quite an interesting person. But you could also win a new 1954 luxury Cadillac convertible if you entered. So we realized cranberries were big business. Not only did they have Miss Cranberry, but they had Miss Eat More Cranberry Girl. And here, by the period of the 1960s, we see a Darlington dry cranberry harvester in this instance, it doesn't flood the cranberry bogs, but harvests the cranberries in a real-type harvester while trimming the plants. This was the successor to the one that was the Chandler's that was pushed, much like a real mower, R-E-E-L. But in this instance, this was done in cranberry bogs in Hanson and Wareham. And here, cranberries are typically harvested in October, early October. And we flood the bogs with water and then use water reel harvesting machines that loosen the cranberries from the vines. With small air pockets in the center, the cranberries float to the water surface and are gathered and then harvested. And here, today, cranberry bogs are actually dry for the majority of the growing season and only flooded at harvest time. And when the bogs are flooded, the cranberries are dislodged and float to the top of the water, making it easy to collect them. The vast majority of cranberries are harvested in this way and then are processed to make dried fruit, sauce, and the official beverage of Massachusetts, the cranberry juice. A small percentage of cranberry bogs are dry harvested or picked by a mechanical harvester or by hand rather than being flooded. And dry harvested cranberries are usually only sold as fresh fruit on roadside stands. And here you can see a group of cranberries that have now been actually flooded and they continue to draw in the individual sides so they can harvest them. This is what I see sometimes in the Cape and it's a beautiful thing to see with the colors. But the idea also is these two men, and you've probably seen them on television, inspired by Grant Wood's American Gothic, each commercial begins with the same fixed shot of Henry Strozier and Justin Hagen up to their knees in floating cranberries. This was the Gilmore family's commercial bogs, and they were a commercial bog that was located in Carver, Massachusetts. And of course, how do we really serve it? Well, the next time it's ice cream, and this is a cranberry sauce sundae. Vanilla ice cream with, of course, cranberry sauce that's been heated until it's the liquid form. Delicious, tart, and sweet at the same time. But cranberries can be very versatile. One of my favorites is the cranberry old-fashioned. And here you have a wonderful drink that's partly sugar, bitters, rye whiskey, and cranberry juice. And you realize with a shaking of it, with an orange rind and fresh cranberries to garnish, you create the perfect drink for Thanksgiving Day. There's also the Cosmo. 
Cosmopolitan is my favorite drink at a restaurant. It has vodka, triple sec, cranberry juice, fresh lime juice, and a lime slice. Something, again, that utilizes the cranberries in a little bit different way. And, of course, we have the Cape Codder, a cocktail consisting of vodka and cranberry juice. Originally, it was called the Red Devil, and rumors suggested that it actually got its start at the bars of Cape Cod in the summer. However, there are multiple versions of the drink, starting with the Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. This cocktail is named after the Kennedy family's matriarch and mother of John F. Kennedy. The recipe is similar to the traditional Cape Codder, except it also adds club soda, obviously for her effervescent personality. And the Scarlet O'Hara. This was served at Brennan's French restaurant in New Orleans, a combination of fresh lime juice, ocean spray cranberry juice, and southern comfort. Shake well with cracked ice and strain into a glass. Every one of them are different, but they utilize cranberries a little bit differently than just simply cranberry sauce. And we realize that even Celestial Seasons Herb Teas in 1985 use this as Cranberry Cove. This tea is slightly sweet, tangy, and is perfect any time. And that wonderful caption, as you realize, the photograph of the girls picking, I love their um, wicker baskets, but you realize how important this was. So there was not only drinks, but tea as well. And of course, there are health benefits to cranberries. Number one, it treats urinary tract infections buy some on the way home. Number two, fights cancer. Number three, fights heart disease. Number four, helps kidney and bladder problems. Number five, prevents dental problems. Number six, promotes weight loss. Number seven, anti-aging properties. Number eight, improves mental health. Number nine, strengthens the immune system. And number 10, relieves skin conditions. My God, what a versatile fruit. It's something in some ways we should all adhere to. Well, even here, cranberry fruit concentrate, 4,200 milligrams of what is basically with vitamin C and E, here's to your health. Puritan's Pride Cranberry Fruit Concentrate. Something, again, if the cranberry sauce or the drinks haven't done the job, this could actually help. So in this instance, cranberries may be a tangy and delicious fruit, but don't believe that they are just a pretty plant. Cranberries are loaded with health benefits that stretch through the whole human body, and researchers are certain that the extent of their benefits are growing as more and more research is conducted. Cranberries were recognized by the Dietary Guidelines for America as a nutrient-dense fruit. So... Hopefully this has dispelled your whole concept of what basically was a can of cranberry sauce. Cranberries are a versatile fruit, and in some ways we don't use enough of them, obviously. But it's in some ways during the holiday season at Thanksgiving that we realize they take on a new form, something that we don't really see through the rest of the year. But anyway, I hope you'll have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for coming. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, I'm not originally from New England, but um, we visited a, the Ocean Spray Visitors Center one yeah. time, yeah. and then it was gone. Can you tell me anything about the history of that? One of the things, the Ocean Spray Center was closed simply for the fact that they didn't get enough people to warrant the people that ran it. And I think sometimes, I, I don't think cranberry bogs are all that sexy or interesting. I like to watch them because of the color and the change in season. But it was really true. People didn't go. I mean, you have to really market this in a way to bring in school children, young adults, but also the traveling public during the fall in New England's wonderful uh, leaf season. But it was really the lack of interest.
Thanks for this. This was a great presentation, lots oh, of knowledge. You. And I might have missed, when did the floating of the cranberry start? Well, it did really start in the period of the 1920s and 1930s. Everything was done by hand previous to that time. And I think the Chandler scoop was something they thought would actually save for hand picking. But the floating of the things meant that they also had to have a deep enough bog. Some of these bogs were only a foot or two, but some of the bogs could actually go down three, four, five feet. So the idea was by floating them, and they had to have a water source, it was much easier to do. And today, as you saw with that commercial with the two men, I always love it, they're so dorky, but I love it because it shows them up to their hips with cranberries, and we're eating that, by the way. And I'm saying, wow, that's incredible. But it's been cultivated in such a way that those bogs, which are probably four, four feet deep, are something that then can provide enough space that they can bring in the net and then, of course, bring them up to a conveyor belt. So the 1920s it started. By the 1950s, it was perfected. Is um, the uh, is Cape Cod becoming like less of a place to have cranberries? Is it changing over time? It's more vacation and less cranberry harvesting. Is is kind of like losing its importance? It is reducing. It seems to be more like Middleborough, Onset, Wareham. It's a it was the gateway to Cape Cod at one time before the canal was cut. But the idea is in some ways, I think a lot of times you look at these, they're done more for effect today. We go to one in Yarmouth. We're in Austerville in the summer. So Yarmouth is uh, maybe 20 miles away. And there's a little red bus. It's painted cranberry red. And they have a dog, and it's a young couple, and they have a bog. And they sell a gallon of cranberries for $10. Now, I use it in everything. I do it in roast pork. I do it in all sorts of things. But it seems it's more for effect than it is for economic profit. I think Ocean Spray has cornered the business, and we see it not only in New England, but across the country. But I think sometimes on Cape Cod, it's become one of those wonderful memories of the past. It's not so much an economic. But in the early part of the 19th century, Captain Henry Hall, who did have cranberry bogs, there was one year that the dunes actually saw the sand going all over his cranberry box. And I read that it was something that he was mortified. What am I going to do? And he had such a huge crop of cranberries that by fate, he found out how to grow them. But again, it was all done by hand. And it was a marketable commodity. But I think today it's more commercial in certain areas of the country. And Wisconsin is one of the big, it's even bigger than Massachusetts, I hate to say. <laughs> Any other questions? Or is anybody going to have whole or uh, jellied cranberry sauce? <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, one. Oh, very. We do too, so. Well, thank you all for coming, and happy Thanksgiving.